Please hold the line. We will answer your call as soon as possible. Today, my guest on Please Hold is Martin Varsovsky. Martin is a seven-time entrepreneur that started in Argentina, went to New York, was based in Spain, and now is in beautiful Miami. He is the founder and CEO of Prelude. Prelude Fertility is trying to help women have babies, healthy babies, when they want to have them in life. So it's a very uh, great goal, and I'm really happy to have you here today. My first question is around your first business, actually. Um, you started your business career in New York, and you were converting these old spaces into lofts, kind of a bit of ahead of your time. My question is, why not stay on that path? Real estate, it's kind of a predictable path to make a lot of money, and you could have been like, well, not politically, but uh, from a business perspective, like Donald Trump <laughs> or, or somebody, one of the great uh, real estate magnets of the city. So what took you, after being successful in it, off that course and into technology? Well, it's interesting you said that because, indeed, my first company was Urban Capital, and I worked a lot with uh, converting lofts into residential and office space, so industrial space into residential and office space, and I did half a million square feet of loft space in downtown Manhattan, but I actually didn't like the people I met in that industry. <laughs> actually, the people I met in that industry, many were act like Donald Trump. They were greedy. They were selfish. They were self-centered. They were egomaniacs. Uh, but there's and, a lot of ego in tech. I mean, there's ego in tech, but the people in tech, uh, most of them have a higher intellect. I would say that people in real estate, uh, they are, they think further. I mean, one thing is to convert space, and another thing is to help people have healthy babies when they're ready. I mean, I'm very happy with the changes I made in my life. I always kept real estate as a side activity, and I did investments through, throughout my career, and sometimes I would cash out of a tech company and buy real estate. Like, I own a farm in Sagaponac in Long Island or another farm in Menorca, and I, I always made these real estate investments. But I... I think technology is just, it makes the world better, and I'm happy to be part of that. So you felt like you're doing a more noble thing. A more noble, interesting, challenging thing among people of higher intellect than the people in real estate. Fair enough. I hope Donald Trump's not watching this, because we're going to get <laughs> tweeted out like crazy. So your first, after your first big exit, which I think was Viettel, uh, you established the Varsovsky Foundation. And I found it so interesting that you established it in Argentina. And you were doing things like helping bring internet to people and stuff like that. Um, Argentina is not a country that treated you and your family so great. What made you go back there and start your foundation there? Well, I mean, it's been, I've always had a troubled relationship with Argentina because I had to leave there as a child and they military government killed my cousin and they almost killed my father and I and friends of mine in high school were getting killed just just for being Jewish right that was for being the main problem Jewish and for being intellectual and for being democratic let's say for being in favor of democracy during a dictatorship so thinking outside of what the government wanted you to think yeah the government wanted uh, everyone to be happy with their military dictatorship and I think very few people were and if you would open your mouth about it they would kill you yeah and so we had to flee and Senator Moynihan of New York gave us refugee visa so I came to the United States as a refugee and when Argentina went back to democracy and I personally started doing well in business I wanted to prevent these things from ever happening again in Argentina. And so I felt that building Educar, where I donated $11 million to start Educar, which was the initiative that then became the government's initiative to connect schools to the internet, provide content. Uh, I mean, I donated this money to the Ministry of Education, which then raised much more money from corporates and from other sources. And over $600 million were invested in the end over 15 years in Educar. And Educar trains teachers 
uh, help students, connect schools. And I think it has been a great initiative and it has partly helped uh, prevent another dictatorship from happening in Argentina. It's obviously many other things prevented, but when my cousin was killed and many people were getting killed in the 70s, the military took over and controlled every possible means of communication, the telecom network, TV, newspapers. Now it's much harder to do. Great. And you could argue that perhaps Kirshner and the Kirshner family was a little bit of dictators, but I guess they were still democratically elected and it was a different no, thing. No, I mean, whatever, I, I'm not a sympathizer of the Kirshners, but they were no nowhere near the military dictatorship. Yeah, they had some initiatives that I would consider maybe not ideally democratic, but Argentina is much better now than it was when I was growing up. Yep. I wanted to ask you about business and specifically actually about Steve Jobs. Um, he, there are other people like Steve Jobs, a notoriously difficult man to work for, not always nice to the people around him, but you can't deny the results that he created. Tremendous success. I'm curious if you think it's possible to be wildly successful in business and kind of still be a nice guy. And do you think you've achieved that? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not always a nice guy, but I try to be. Steve Jobs didn't try to be. I mean, I spent, I met Steve Jobs. I spent like uh, once 90 minutes alone with him uh, on the subject of Wi-Fi and phone. And he was an incredibly aggressive man. Uh, the first thing he said to me when I walked into his office, this was, I think, in 08 or 07, 08, he said to me, oh, you're Martin Varsavsky of Fon. Uh, we love Fon, but we're going to do Fon without you. Right? <laughs> that was, the, that was that his was your opening, intro. <laughs> opening line. Okay. And we basically fought for 90 minutes. And I am... I am not a person who picks fights, and I thought I was going to see Buddha, and I ended up meeting somebody whose personality uh, is, is, was notoriously difficult, but somehow I hadn't found out. His PR got to me ahead of what my friends should have told me. Uh, I, think, I think Larry and Sergey are extremely nice people. I think Mark Benioff is an incredibly nice person. I think Jeff Bezos is sometimes tough, but very nice and, and approachable. Uh, well, even Tim Cook, who I met only a couple of times, but I think he's also uh, quite nice and approachable and reasonable. I think Zuckerberg is a little introverted, but also, and certainly Cheryl Sandberg is extremely uh approachable and nice and sensitive uh so all the other very very successful tech leaders are are pretty nice maybe a difficult one another difficult one is larry ellison um who but, is best friends with steve jobs but, yeah yeah <laughs> interestingly but most most people michael dell is incredibly nice and approachable um, yeah, so most leaders are are uh, pretty remarkable people in that sense that they're so successful and yet kind and considerate. So it's possible. I think it is possible. I think Steve Jobs was the exception, and I do not think he was successful because he was like that, which is a mistake a lot of people make. I think he was successful because he was such a visionary that in spite of his awful personality, he was still successful. So it's almost like his own worst enemy was himself. And get, yes. Getting past that. Well, it was successful. himself to the point that he could be alive today. Yeah. And because he was such a radical thinker about everything, he didn't get his cancer checked on time and he died. Yeah. So you're about to have seven kids. Or your seventh. My kid. seventh child. Um, tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> so this is an important day. Um, are you going for some sort of Guinness World Record? <laughs> No, I I mean, I love being a dad. It's the best thing I've ever done. I love my children. I, I think that humans were made 
we evolved to live maybe until the age of 30, 35, but thanks to medicine, we now live until maybe 85, 90, uh, especially if you made it in your, into your 50s like yourself and the rest of your life expectancy is in the maybe 80s, 90s. And I think if you're going to live until you're 90, the idea that you should have children only in your 20s it's an early 30s it's just nonsensical to the lifespan we now have and i i think having children is the most wonderful thing in the world i think a lot of people believe that they can't afford having children or they think that children are an economic burden and i think while children are uh, you have to support and pay for their education and so on. I think that the United States does offer uh, good uh, public schooling and there's ways of being a parent that, that doesn't mean you have to give up on your life. And what you gain for that incredible moments when you come home and they shout, Dad, and, and they come and hug you, I mean, it's all worth it. So I've met... I think all of your kids now. Mm -hmm. And what always interests me is you've somehow managed to raise these kids and you've achieved, while they were growing up, a lot of financial success. And they live in nice houses and sometimes travel on private planes and all this stuff, but they're grounded. And mm -hmm. somehow they still get up every morning and want to make it for themselves. How did you do that? Well, I grew up middle class, the son of a professor, and I always kept my middle class values. And I told my kids that any wealth is temporary and that you have to continuously generate value in whatever you do, that you can't rely on the previous work of other people to make it happen for you. And that even if you did get money, you wouldn't get value, that you have to generate your own value to society, that you have to contribute to society. And the way you contribute is through work and so the work ethic of my older kids is amazing and they've done incredible things at a very very in their early 20s and i but they I, could have just said dad that's great but we're gonna get this house so i'm not gonna yeah. work so hard like, yeah how did you well i i did tell them i mean concretely i did i did say to them that there was no money after they graduated from university, so they better find a job. So that I made, okay. <laughs> I made clear. Uh, and so I, I set the rules. I said, I'll pay for your education, and that's it. Um, so yes, there's, there's some order to this that you, it's not a choice. This is basically, they have to earn a living. Mm -hmm. And I think if you start talking like that when they're 12, by the time they have to earn a living, they got the idea. Yeah. Well, as a new father, I'm going to take mm -hmm. that to heart. Um, you're one of the most open people I know. I mean, you post a ton on Facebook, on Twitter, on your blog. Um, you're also quite busy, and you have a large family. What do you get out of being so open? Do you think you get back more in return than you give? To me, social media has helped me uh, meet remarkable people uh, sometimes hear that some idea of mine which I think is great uh, be destroyed in a in an organized fashion like I would post some idea and somebody else would destroy it in a very reasonable way that sometimes makes me think that actually maybe it was a, a bad idea like it's a sounding board of for ideas it also I do like the fact that uh, each social network has a purpose. Twitter news dissemination, Facebook personal events, LinkedIn, career enhancement. And I think when you learn to use these networks uh, appropriately, you get a lot out of them. And it's, that's why billions of people join them. They can't all be idiots. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I wanted you to talk for a minute about Columbia University. You you teach, uh, is it master students or undergrads? No, uh, the Columbia Business School, MBA okay. students. MBA students. 
and you've, you've foregone the typical tests and structure of a classroom and you actually make them do something that's kind of unique. Will you talk about what you're doing in the classroom? Yeah, I, what I do at, at Columbia is create, well, first of all, the class is about how do you turn an idea into a business? And that's something that interests a narrow group of highly motivated individuals who have ideas and want to turn them into businesses. And so I found that the role, the traditional role of the professor fails in this type of environment. That what you have to do is uh, enable the students to come up with their projects. And so I created these unicoins, uh, which was ahead of Bitcoin. It's, it's now a coincidence that there's Bitcoin, but I had this system before Bitcoin, which is I transformed the ability of the university that the university gave me to great students into mm -hmm. a currency that I distribute evenly among the students. So at the start of the class, every student gets a million unicoins. But then the, during the class, as they start sharing their ideas and turning their ideas into projects, and Kickstarter like videos or presentations, they start trading, they start investing in each other. And then the value of the projects, the relative value of the projects changes from a completely egalitarian mode of the first day in class to some projects that really take off. And so the students who have the best funded projects get the best grades when they convert their unicorns back to university grades. Wow. So it starts communism and gets very capitalistic quickly. Yes. <laughs> I mean, in, in, the, in the end, I, I had the idea for teaching this class when I, I read an article in the Harvard Business Review that they had done an experiment that among the MBA students and they first asked students to raise their hand if they thought they were going to be successful. And everybody raised their hand. And then they asked them, a uh, point to the person who's going to be the most successful in this class. And they turn out not to point randomly, but there was a lot of accumulation. They were signaling success to a few students hmm. were, were getting signaled for success. So I thought, ah, if I can pick up this signaling power in a currency system, that will save me from the agony of having to grade students, which I never thought if I was grading them or degrading them. Yep, that's great. Changing human behavior and habits is really hard, and most businesses iterate and make it slightly better, but don't change it completely. Um, with Prelude, you're trying to change human behavior, right? You're trying to get women in their 20s who may be thinking, especially early 20s, about what club they're going to go to or what bar they want to go to that night to actually think about their future and their fertility at a time when most women don't. Um, why do you think now is the time where you can actually change that human behavior and, and make that uh, achieve the scale it needs to achieve? Well, I hope I'm successful in this. I'm, I'm, I think with the right tools, I'll be able to be successful. But indeed, the biggest problem we have is to link the biology and the psychology of women and men too, because men also should freeze their sperm and think ahead because older men tend to have children with more mental illness. But for women, it's a more an all or nothing. They can mostly, all of them have babies at 25 and almost none of them at 45. And so from 25 to 45, the fertility is gone. Actually, from 25 to 35 is, is ideal. And from 35 to 45, uh, over half of the women who try to have a baby fail. And so, and so the question is, how do you bridge the biology with the psychology? When you want to have babies, you're not able to. But when you were able to, you didn't want to, right? And so... We have ideas of how to achieve that, and it's mainly through uh, education, education driven by physicians. We feel that gynecologists are doing a terrible job by prescribing the pill and not alerting women at the same time that the pill masks their infertility, that it makes them believe they're regular, and, they, and, and indeed many aren't. Mm -hmm. And, and we be, I believe the pill 
should come with health warnings like like cigarette packages because the bill has done great for people not to have children but has done uh, has prevented many people to have children indeed a third of all women who turned 45 last year in America uh, hadn't achieved their maternity goals indeed 19% had no children and 22% only had one. And so it is, it is, uh, and only 4% of women actually said they never wanted children. So there's a shortage of children and we have to achieve this goal. So we'll achieve it working with the medical community, helping gynecologists, OBGYNs realize that they should talk about both that the conversation about the pill has to be a conversation about fertility also, like, well, at some point, would you like to have a child and start that conversation? We'll work on social media. Women have self-organized already and they are, they are doing egg freezing almost as a social movement. But we believe that Prelude is not only about egg freezing, it's about having healthy babies when you're ready. So we believe genetic testing of embryos is a much more humane way of dealing with this problem than what we now do, which is we systematically test women who are pregnant with amnios and an IPTs, and then we recommend that they abort if there's something wrong with their baby. But they're four months pregnant. They, they wanted that baby. Mm -hmm. So we believe testing embryos and testing sperm and eggs and testing parents for, for them being carriers of genetic illness is much better than uh, aborting in a large scale because it's sad, because abortion is not a question of pro-choice, pro-life. It's a question of anybody who is in favor of abortion as a choice, like, like I am, but it's a, it's a bad choice. It's much better to use contraceptives or it's much better to do genetic skinning of embryos, which are the two reasons why you would end up aborting, yep. which we want to prevent. You're also making it very affordable. I mean, I think you told me it's around $200 a month. To, yes. And you commit for a period of time. In the past, I think when people think of IVF and, and stuff like that, it's many thousands of dollars that most women in their 20s can't afford. Yeah, we're doing something that normally costs twelve to $25,000. We're selling it in a monthly subscription model of $199 a month. So women in their late 20s, early 30s, or early 20s, this is going to be, you know, the cost of a couple of dinners in a large city or the cost of a gym subscription of a, or a cellular plan for, for a family because we're not only geared to single people, we're very targeting single and married or committed people because there's a lot of people who are married and love each other want to have children, but not at that moment in their life. And in fact, the, the, what happens here is that in many cases, they get to have their first child, but not their second child, because they want to push their second child to the late 30s and early 40s. And they get these wrong ideas. They see like a Janet Jackson's having a child at 50, but obviously she had a child with egg donation, and egg donation is not clearly disclosed. So People who are having babies in their 40s and 50s are using egg donation and they, they think they can use their own eggs and in many cases they can't and almost for sure after in the, into the 40s they can't. And so um, we want to help married couples too mm -hmm. uh, plan their lives. It's great. So you have homes in many places around the world. If I put a gun to your head and said, you have to choose a country, you can't keep <laughs> moving around. What country would you choose? Uh, the, the, it's hard. I mean, I, I chose the U.S. and I became a permanent resident recently. And so I, I came back to the U.S. because I think the U.S. has this incredible opportunity for entrepreneurs. But I always do my alternative thing. So I came to Miami instead of going to San Francisco or New York or L.A. or Boston. The more, the more entrepreneurial hubs. Uh, but the U.S. is where we are now, and Prelude is a U.S.-based company. We raised $200 million for it. We were incredibly well-received. I got these great investors with the equity, and I, I'm very, we're very happy here. So you're going to be here for a while. I think I'll be here for a while, yeah. All right. Well, that's our gain.
Thank you so much for being on. No, thank you for doing this. <laughs> Did you like what you just saw? You want to see more? Go ahead and subscribe. We have new episodes every Tuesday. And if there's someone you want to see on the show, just add them as a comment down below. We'll take a look and we'll have them on if we can. Thanks again.